So um, we have this original function and what I really loved that I did with uh, with somebody is we kind of thought through this. We just kind of created a plan. Creating a plan is always a great idea. So if I'm going to find the relative extrema, what's the plan? Big ideas. Yeah, Sammy, just go. Um, we're going to have to find kind of our, our boundaries for those um, extremes. So basically, we're just going to have to figure out derivative and double derivative. Do we need both? Um, I think I need both, but I mean, you might not need both. I might just have a dearth of information. Okay, so let's go with one at least. Let's find the first derivative. Then what are we going to do if we're looking for relative extrema? Find your critical values. Yeah, we want to find our crit values. So we really want to set g prime of x equal to zero or undefined. And I'm just going to write that down because this is our planning phase. I love having this plan. And then after that, uh, what are we going to do after that? Maybe I should be making that in a different color. But what are we going to do after that? Well, I didn't want to do the first derivative test, so I found the second derivative. So I could see the concavity at our critical values. So then I could find... The, whether it was a max or min and get my extrema. All right, so what you're saying is, first we want to find the derivative, then we want to use that to find critical values where we might have relative extrema, and then we're going to check to see what they are, right? And we could go ahead and write this because ultimately keep in mind those critical values are really going to give us X values, and then we're just going to check to see what's happening at those X values. So let's go ahead and execute said plan. G prime of X, and I know we can all do this one pretty easily, is 3x squared subtract 14x subtract 5. There's step one. If at any point in time you feel like I did something wrong or I'm going too fast, just throw a flag or verbally throw a flag. That works too, okay? So <clears throat> then we wanted to figure out when this, now we're in step two, right? We're in step two right here. And so... Um, we want to figure out when this is zero. I'm going to show that it's zero or undefined. I want to show this, and I don't want to say equal because that would be a linkage error. Um, <clears throat> okay, so g prime of x equals zero. g prime of x is undefined. So when does this happen? What values did you get? Just shout them out. I got five and negative one third. Agrees, disagrees, making sure we can move forward. All right, so Sammy is just about done, FYI. Um, so that's step two, and there's no spots where G prime of X is undefined because it's a polynomial. We always have a defined value. So we can move on from there. All right, so now we're on step three. Right, We need to check to see what these are. Are they relative maximums or minimums? Okay. Um, out of curiosity, Abby mentioned two things. She said the first derivative test or the second derivative test. I'm curious which one you guys prefer here and maybe why. First derivative test, second derivative test. There's a fifth derivative test? I just have a really fast question. Oh. Can I ask it? Yeah, questions are allowable from you, just not right. extra statements of, of goodness. Since it's a positive third degree polynomial, could I just drew out and said, okay, here's a generic positive third degree polynomial. We have negative one third, which is on the left, positive five, which is on the right. So then I know which one's my minimum and maximum. Um. In theory, yes, but sidestepping the calculus is often frowned upon by AP graders. If you had a response like that, which I love, you would have to spell it out completely so how you knew the shape was doing this, which you're going to have to make an argument to how you know that. You know what I mean? And then, and then it's still going to get kicked off of the AP graders table and it's going to go to the head reader and the head reader is going to want to break it down. So, so it's not about being right, it's about knowing the calculus. Yeah, a lot okay. of times. 
I mean, I think that you probably would end up getting kicked to the head reader and getting full credit as long as you've spelled your argument out really well. But they're going to get really particular with you then. They're going to bristle if you use any versions of like it and pronouns and you know what I mean? They're going to be nitpicky. So the less, the more calculus you use, the less nitpicky they're probably going to be. Okay. Thank you. I know that sucks. All right. So, um. What I'm seeing is a lot of us said first derivative test, so we're not going to do that. We'll we'll do that for one and not the other. Abby, why did you say second derivative test? Well, in that case, well, your second derivative, once you find it, like a function for it, you get g double prime of x equals 6x minus 14. And then I just plugged in the critical values I got. So I got, I plugged in five, and then I plugged in negative one third, and when I plugged in five, that was positive. So I know that was going to be concave up, which there's a minimum there. Pause right there. Pause, 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 because you're giving us a lot. Notice what she said. She said, all right, the second derivative wasn't hard to get. Then I can just plug in my critical value. So she's saying at x equals five, um, <clears throat> g of x is concave up because, you know, g double prime of x is greater than zero, so x equals five is a relative minimum on g of x. I see this, I don't see this. All right, just because we can, because we're awesome like that, Let's go ahead and, and flip, and we'll use the first derivative test for the other one. So what about the other spot? What would the first derivative test look like? It's like a compare and contrast. You go ahead. Any um, so what I did for, I think it's the first derivative test anyways, I plugged in, uh, let's see, I did g prime of negative 1, I found that, which was 12, and then I knew that g prime of negative 1 third is equal to 0, and then I did g prime of 0, and that equals negative 5. So from that information, I knew that if we were looking at the graph of g of x, it would be, um, at first it would be, have an increasing, well, yeah, it would have a positive slope, and then it would plateau or kind of hit zero and stop and change directions and start heading, ne having a negative slope. So it was going to be a maximum I see this, I don't see this. So then if I'm gonna make this argument, I want you to see what the arguments look like too, right? So, cause that helps. Um, so what I'm gonna say in the end here is that, uh, when X is less than negative one third, G prime of X is greater than zero, positive. Uh, when x is greater than negative one third, g prime of x is less than zero, negative. So at x equals negative one third, g of x has a relative maximum. Because I would have already shown in my work that, um, you know, that g prime of negative one third equals zero. So they're not going to need me to spell that out um, in my response, my final response typically, because they've already seen that really coming up in my work. But we do have to spell out um, this work or um, even this work. Okay. Um, so that's really what we need to spell out in our explanation. So looking at the two of these, what questions might you have first? Dylan? What would the second derivative test look like if it wasn't a maximum or minimum? 
Oh, if it was if it was neither, if it failed, yeah, you you would have gotten zero in the second derivative for the second derivative. Okay. Which is inconclusive, right? Because you're looking for positivity, um, concave up, or negativity concave down. And so if you get concave neutral zero, you're like uh, uh, okay. And then we just flip back to the first derivative test. Other questions? That was a good question, Dylan. All right, so here's my question, because Sarah had actually kind of asked it too. Um, is there like one that's always going to be better or like which one, I think it was Sarah or maybe it was Ariana. I don't remember. Somebody, somebody said like, do you prefer one or another? Is, is one typically better or is actually is one better? And my answer, good quality painter style is it depends. Why? Why does it depend? Or even your first derivative, because with, if one looks simpler than the other to you, then I think it'd be easier to do it that way. So in this case, look at how easy it was for us to get our second derivative. And in doing this, I only need to check one value. That makes it fast. You know what I mean? Not only that, but literally I could have just said... Um, I could have really just said blah, blah. So it actually does make my, my explanation a little more concise too. It was fast in that case. But I think Sarah's hitting the nail on the head. What if our, our first derivative was ugly? What if it was a, you know, a, a rational function and getting the second derivative is hard? And why would you ever go to the second derivative test in that case unless you were forced to? Now, bottom line is we do need to know both because they're going to make you argue from wherever they want. They have very fancy ways. The AP graders are awesome at manipulating questions to make you have to look from various angles. So you need to know both, but you do have choices here, and that's the bottom line. Okay, The first derivative test wasn't bad for this one either. What questions do we have on the first derivative test and the second derivative test? Okay, so let's go ahead and delete all of that and get back to uh, question number two. So this one right here, determine the location of all inflection points. Let's map this one out. What the heck is an inflection point? A point where concavity changes. Concavity changes. And I love how you phrase that. Okay, there's a cardinal mistake a lot of students often make here. So concavity changes. So what are we going to need to look for? Mm -hmm. No, go, Judy, go. You need to, like, make another, like, number line for the second derivative. Ah, so you're saying we're looking for when the second derivative does what? When it's negative or positive. When it goes positive to negative or negative to positive. Yeah, so when it goes to zero, basically. Yeah, so we do want to look for, for these, right? Because those are going to be indicators, but we still really need to check if that happened. The cardinal mistake that students make, cardinal mistake, is that students go, inflection points. Oh, this guarantees it. No, it does not. Okay? It is an indicator only. So no big deal here. Uh, let's go ahead and get our second derivative again. What was it? 6x minus 14. Ah, 6x minus 14. And then we said, oh, okay, let's look for when that's zero. Now, you're also going to want to check undefined spots too for concavity changes. Okay, they wouldn't actually be a, they'd be a concavity change. They wouldn't be an inflection point, but they would be a concavity change. Um, and that just sometimes helps us analyze functions. This one doesn't have any, thank God, so... And so when we do that algebra, we're going to get x equals 14 over 6, or 7 um, thirds, right? Good? Not so good. 
So then, like we go, that, that was step three, right? That was like our last step. That's kind of where we're starting. Now we do got to go back and just double check. Okay, so let's look at G double prime. I'm going to use my fancy number line, which is really just a table if you think about it, right? We kind of think about it as a table. <clears throat> uh, we don't have to. We could. So at X equals seven thirds, we know that the second derivative is zero. So the question becomes what happened before that? You know, what was the concavity before that? So I would just plug in a number like zero. Think about that. We get we get a negative 14, so we really get a negative. I don't really care about the 14. And then plug in a value afterwards, like, I don't know, 10. Because <laughs> it's easy. You know, and we're going to get 60 minus 14, so a positive number. And so then we can say, <clears throat> you know, that there's an inflection point at 7 thirds. Now I'm going to need... Uh, the y value in theory, and I would have needed that here too, and I'm sorry I didn't say that earlier. So I would need like uh, g of 7 thirds. I actually need that one, okay? Um, and then I would say is an inflection point because g double prime of x switches, uh, I probably spelled it wrong, from negative to positive at x equals 7 thirds. Now notice I didn't use the whole greater than zero, less than zero in this case. A lot of students like to say it this way, and I have seen they definitely take it, um, at least from what I've seen. They like the other format a little bit better, I think, but this form will work, okay? So that guarantees it's an inflection point.